So both of you are super strong athletes yourself. Matthew, maybe one of the strongest, maybe the strongest street lifter in the world. Yad, medical doctor, experienced statics and street lifting athlete yourself. And uh, still, you both experience the kind of the same thing, thing that uh, dominates calisthenics these days. Um, and today we want to talk about this thing. So maybe starting off, Matthew, um, what happened? What, what happened? <laughs> well, I had my bicep tear around one and a half years ago in May of 2022. And at that time I was running a high volume chin up cycle. And essentially what happened is I overloaded myself and one day on the max out and the weight there wasn't even that high. It was 97.5 kilos, which was supposed to be a set of six. And on the first rep, I tore my bicep clean off the bone. What followed was uh, surgery three days after the injury happened. And then a period of rehab, which resulted in my complete recovery. And recently, I've been even hitting new all-time PRs on the chin-up. So I made... Not just a full recovery, but more than a full recovery. So I'm back even stronger than I was before the injury. It's basically the short version of what happened. Would you be stronger now without the injury? Or do you think uh, it somehow even like gave you a benefit? Well, I don't know. Probably my potential... I could have potentially been stronger without the injury because I wasted a lot of time rehabbing myself, but I don't think that it impacted like my maximum possible strength. I don't feel it affecting me right now. That's crazy. That's uh, like super positive news for you, for example, Yad, who experienced this this uh, like mo much more recently. Maybe you want to tell us about more uh, more about your journey. Yeah, m mine happened uh, about four four weeks ago um, during a Maltese. I was um, just, you know, doing some prep work, warming up. And usually um, when I do a Maltese, I do it on P-bars. Uh, but in this particular gym, the P-bars kept slipping. So, you know, I tried to put some rubbers down and then try it again. And I was doing it with assistant with the black with the black band so it wasn't anything crazy and then i thought you know fuck it let me just put my hands down and i'm gonna just do it with my hands it's it's the black uh, band i can do it on rings i can do it on p-bars uh, i've been resting for three days i am not in a you know i, I just deloaded uh the, like this is the beginning of a cycle i think it was even the mid cycle non-fatigued at all a very low volume uh, cycle that i was running i was experimenting with low low volume um, because I was going for the world record fund lever. So I didn't want to actually do a lot of work. And as I was, as I was le leaning forward for my second set, holding it, I felt absolutely nothing. And then a shock happened in my left uh, elbow. Uh, and that's where um, I immediately let go. I fell, I looked at my arm and you couldn't really see anything. You didn't see the, the typical Popeye sign, uh, the reverse Popeye sign, which is where the bicep goes up the arm. Um, so I, I had some hope that it was just a little spring, but eventually the day after we made an uh, ultrasound and it was torn 50%. So there's two differences between me and Matthew. I think you had a proximal tear. So at the shoulder. No, no, I had oh, a distal had the... tear. Oh, also distal. Okay, sick. Perfect. I had a complete uh, distal tear. 100% of my tendon was gone. Yeah. Yeah. So he had a full one. I had a 50% one. And uh, the funny thing is, about a year ago on Fitness FAQ's uh, podcast, I, 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 I told him I, this is the scariest uh, injury, you know, the one I'm the most afraid of. But I, what I didn't tell him, which, which I always thought, is I'd rather um, be fully torn or instead of partially torn because, because the science and the surgeons are scared to operate on a partial Everyone's afraid to operate on a partial because one, we have too little data on whether you should operate on a partial. Two, we have, uh, uh, like, it, it looks weird to operate on a partial because you can still see the bicep working. Oh, this, this one's a lot bigger. <laughs> uh, 
um, which makes which makes it for a doctor very weird to operate on a healthy man with one percent chance of giving him lifelong complications. Um, and so after that injury happened, I had to go to many doctors as a doctor myself, convincing them that I should probably get operated on. And they all refused. And uh, then I had to, and the reason why I wanted to get operated on was because there is some data showing that people who have a 2B partial tear, 2B basically means more than 50%, um, they are better off getting operated on. And this is in a population of 50 year old people, men, usually men that are doing construction work, et cetera, and they uh, tear the biceps and then eventually the, the, the group that gets operated on has better results versus the one that doesn't. But there's no study done on athletes and especially none on calisthenics athletes. And all of those studies, I think, show a little bit of retraction. Mine showed zero retraction, meaning none of the tendon is actually moving proximally the upper arm. So I basically landed in a situation where I had a very rare, because a partial is rare, it's really weird for a partial, for, especially in the Maltese. Every Maltese tear I've seen has so far been full. I've seen one or two people who had a partial, which I'll talk about later in this podcast because I've been obsessively reading. Well, and, I, uh, I actually also know a guy who had a partial tear on Maltese. So like personally. Perfect. Maybe it's the same guy. Is it Denton? No. Okay. This it's is a perfect. Kazakh guy. You, probably you don't know him. He's not really that famous, but... I met him in person when I was in Kazakhstan. This is this is perfect because I really want to learn some more about that. Um, but anyway, I'm in a situation where the doctors, the orthopedic surgeons, the sport physicians all don't know what to do. I am now a doubt myself too. And um, eventually we decided to do an MRI. It was confirmed. It was exactly 50%. So not over, not under. Um, so we decided eventually conservatively because no one was actually experienced enough to operate on this. And uh, now I'm in four, four, uh, week four, I can do some curls with two and a half kilos and I'm recovering. But the question is, will I ever be able to safely Maltese, et cetera, which I, is something I will find out myself, but also maybe by talking a little bit with Matthew about the other experiences. It's a lot of talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it's super interesting, um, like knowing that uh, uh, surgery would help you uh, and not getting it, uh, especially with your network. I can imagine being a doctor yourself, you have like a, a better not network that, uh, and experience finding someone should should have uh, than, than a normal person. And uh, when I when I told Matthew about all this uh, situation and all this um, um, yeah uh, interview thing, he, his first reaction was, damn, he needs to get a surgery. And uh, it was like uh, three days after Matthew's uh, injury, he directly got a surgery, uh, which is um, super important for his, uh, for his uh, journey and recovery. So, um, yeah, interesting. So did you ever have the, had the temptation? Maybe it's stupid, but why not try another Maltese and rip the full bicep so you can finally uh, <laughs> like, get, get surgery? Honest. Yeah, honestly, the, the, the times where, because I felt pretty depressed uh, in the past few weeks, there were times where I thought, you know what, you want a full tier? Here's a full tier. That's that's what I've had. But the more I started learning about this um, and the stories that I heard of other people who had a partial tier and who recovered completely conservative, conservatively, which is Denton uh, Conte, he messaged me. He said, hey, I also partially torn. I told nobody in 2021. And now I am like 20, 30 kilos heavier and I can still Maltese. So don't worry, don't get operated on, it's fine. So he gave me a little bit of relief. But again, we're talking about so like such a little percentage of people. Um, like usually studies are done on like a bunch of people. Like it's, it's very hard to base your um, decision on anecdotal evidence. It's just not something I do, but if there's no data, then I, that's the only thing I can run on. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious to what, what the other guy did, Matthew's guy, what, what he did when he got torn. The guy I know, he basically, I don't really know much about his 
recovery, but what I know is that it was conservative, and he also had uh, part of the muscle, muscle belly torn as well. So his bicep is oh. deformed now. It's not like fully capable, but still he does weighted chin-ups. He does street lifting competitions. As far as statics go, I don't know. I haven't seen him Maltese ever since, but in terms of curling and chin-ups, he is all right. And I also remember the guy you probably both know. He is uh, like a legend in old school street workout. His name is Nika Nisimov. You probably know him. And he also had a partial tear on Hephaestus. And uh, he recovered his level, but he still has some issues to this day. And the tear was in 2017 or something. Okay. Yeah, so there's there's another story I have. Uh, Little Beastum, you probably also know him. Little, yeah, Little Beastum also had a partial tear. Um, and for him, he never was able to recover his planche. Uh, he always kept a little bit of pain in his left elbow. Uh, and he told me personally that when he saw my injury that he felt really bad for me. So I was, I was always afraid because I had only his story. Then Denton's story came on my, like on my feed, uh, which gave me a lot more hope and the data again, there was no real data for my situation. So right now I'm in a situation where I don't know what's going to happen. I've had to think a lot about my career for the last 12 years. I've been obsessively training calisthenics probably as Matthew has been, just everything has been about calisthenics. Uh, as a medical doctor, it's it's been especially hard to keep that going. So I had to give up a lot of my life to be able to even maintain this level, let alone get even stronger. And I've never considered even s- stepping away from calisthenics in my life until now. And I'm not saying that I will, um, but I have decided that after 6, 12 months, when I know a little bit more about what my bicep condition is going to be like, that I'm going to have to make choices on whether I want to do the statics like I, wa- I was always doing because I am statics is my thing. And then street work, I was always like a, street lifting was always a way to get my statics stronger. I never was competing. I never competed in that. All I cared about was statics. So now I have to like really consider, do I want to do that? And now now I can talk easily talk about it. But like a few weeks ago, you had you had to see me. I was like, <laughs> I was a baby, <laughs> you know? Yeah, these are these I are difficult the times, and I'm sure Matthew, I'm sure you know because I, because again, we are a weird breed. We are people who go to the gym, we work out. We're not just like the typical gym goer. We are people who just do movements to make to do even crazier movements, and then we keep on doing even crazier movements, and then we keep adding more weight, and we do it as if our entire life depends upon it. And we plan our entire lives around it because not only the workouts don't even matter, they, the, the food matters, the, the, the resting matters, you know, and that has so much impact on our entire lifestyle. And to be in a position where I have to maybe reconsider all of that is, is super weird to be able to go to work. I started working uh, since three days and go to home rather than go to the gym. It's weird to me that I have so much time now. It is weird that I'm not thinking, oh, yeah, I need to stretch. Oh, yeah, I need to do this. Oh, wait, I need to do some planche holds. Oh, yeah, I need to. There's nothing. I'm eating, but even when I'm eating, it's it's different, the mindset. When I am when I was eating before, it was like, yo, am I bulking? Am I cutting? Am I maintaining? What am I doing? <laughs> like, now I'm just <laughs> eating, which is also weird. So there's a lot of habits that I've built for many years that I just don't know what to do with anymore. And I'm curious to how Matthew in probably a very hard time too, because after an operation, you have like, you had probably like many months that you can't do, you couldn't do anything. Well, how, how did you, even... not really, actually, I really, uh, I did my first push ups 11 days after the surgery. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, <laughs> I did a lot of stupid things in my recovery period, but uh, overall it made these things made it even faster. Because I knew that my body was capable of some things that normal people would not be able to do. So yeah. So after my surgery, I had a recovery protocol. Probably, like, you know what is it? Like, the weeks, the week one, week two, week three, week four, etc. Yeah. But uh, first of all, my surgeon was uh, an expert. He fixes, like, 
10, tens of biceps per year. Biceps, pecs, other muscles. So he's a specialist in, in tendon tears. So it was just a routine surgery for him. And he does these surgeries in such a high quality that you don't even need a cast on the arm after it. So you they just release you with a strap and that's it. <laughs> Sick. And you guys uh, are real different. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the thing is that usually when you get rid of the cast, you have your arm stuck in a 90 degree angle and you have to work your range of motion. So you get it back and only then you can start working with a full range of motion with loading. And uh, I started stretching my arm immediately after the surgery and I could straighten it even on day one. Passively, it was painful, but I could straighten it. And uh, this type of approach without the cast without the unnecessary measures, it led to a much faster and uh, manageable recovery. So, and uh, I couldn't really hold myself back from doing some things, but I managed to pull through just fine. And it wasn't... Would you recommend it? Would you recommend it to everyone else to do it like you? Or yeah. Do you have, do you... I think that when it comes to experienced athletes, at least... They I was going to say. Yeah, because yeah. normal people who don't really need to recover as fast as possible to preserve their level, they are probably better off with a more conservative approach so that they are more, more likely to get their functions and strength back without any possible complications. Yeah, so one of the scariest thing of getting a bicep repair, at least in the Netherlands, is that once you tear a bicep repair... So once you've repaired the bicep and you tear it again, they don't operate on you anymore. It's like finished, you're done. So that's why a friend of mine who is a physiotherapist also tore his bicep and he recovered really fast, um, but not as fast as you. Mm -hmm. But he he um, he did have to do the, ni the 90 degrees hold for a few weeks, six weeks in total, I think, or four weeks. And then afterwards you could work in range of motion. But he got, he got back within like... Um, six months he could do uh, a full planche i think he could get back to doing weighted chin-ups like uh almost at his peak uh pronated by how how was your pronated pull-ups just like fine finger? just fine this guy oh my god <laughs> yeah that's amazing because um his problem was pronation and for me it's the same well for me it was was also this way because uh Supination was okay, but pronation was painful for a long time. Same. Which is weird. The reason why I mention this is because the bicep has as function, shoulder flexion, elbow flexion, and supination. Not pronation, supination. And I, for a long time, I couldn't understand why pronation was hurting. I mean, you're stretching the muscle, but this didn't hurt. It still doesn't hurt. But doing this still hurts a little bit. And so when we looked at our MRI with the doctors, we, we, there was a bunch of uh, sport physicians and radiologists. They said the reason why it hurts for me is because underneath the bicep tendon, there's the pronator teres. The pronator teres is one of the main pronators in our elbow. He said the reason why the pain occurs is because that muscle flexes, becomes big just like the bicep. And then it gets against the tendon. It pushes against the bicep tendon. And that's why elbow, that's why pronation hurts for people. That, that was their theory. I don't know if it's ever proven, but that's how they, they looked at it. Look, that's probably why it hurts. And it makes sense to me. It well, makes sense why that would be. I also had my theory about it because uh, what I thought was uh, basically when my bicep was repaired, it for some time it was basically inactive. So when I needed to bend my arm, some other muscles needed to be turned on, especially the brachioradialis. And uh, one of the functions of the brachioradialis is that it pronates the arm. So basically from a neutral position, it can both supinate and pronate. So, and since it was super active in like instead of the bicep, it was doing all the elbow flexion work. It got super tight and uh, pronation was hurting because it was super tight. So that was my theory at least. Yeah. The only thing with, uh, with the theory is the uh, regular radialis can do both, like you said, but it can do it till neutral. So if you're pronated, it's supinate still neutral. 
And if you're supinated and you're pronating, it can do it till neutral. So if you actually pronate, my, my brachioideus now is rested. But if I start from here, now it's contracting till here and then it stops. But, but you are right. What you mentioned is I can't like it. I can't flex it completely. Like even when I flex it com uh, completely, I can put my finger on it and it just jiggles. Whereas when I do that on this side, it doesn't move. And for the longest time, that scared me uh, because I couldn't activate my bicep at all. Later on, I, I, I just realized once I started using my brain, uh, one of the things I noticed is when, when you get emotional, you can't use your brain anymore. It's <laughs> called arthralic, arthralgic inhibition, which is something what happens when your traumatic, uh, traumatic lesions happen to your body. Uh, like, for example, if you get hit by a car, you can't use your uh, leg muscles anymore because they're completely broken. So your body protects it from, from actually pulling from those tendons by just stopping the muscle from working. And the same thing happened, is happening with my bicep, and I have to get that function back. I'm curious, how long did it take for you to finally be able to completely use your bicep again? Well, the full contraction actually took quite a long time. So at the time when I was pulling like maybe 100 kilos with pronated grip, I couldn't probably contract my bicep easily and uh, completely. So only when I had my chin up back to over a hundred kilos, I could contract my bicep fully. Probably a year Damn. or so. So your brachialis and your brachioradialis were, were doing mad work. <laughs> yeah. Back, back then. That's amazing. Right that's now. That's cool. I mean, that's good to know. Well, right now it's okay. So this is the left arm with the tear. And as you can see, it, it's just fine. And this is the right one. Ah, your, your bicep looks nice, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so, as you can see, it's working pretty well. I'm glad to hear that. I hope I can tell the same in, in about a year. I hope I can... Maybe it's a fun idea to do another podcast in a year and see if conservative was actually possible uh, in my situation. Well, I know a guy who actually managed to recover almost completely with a full tear conservatively. And I'm sure you know him. He is Andrei Kobilev. No, no way. He? Yeah. Oh my god! This, this the the guy with the glasses who could do yes. like always. Yes, the what? guy with the glasses. Whoa. Dude, he's so strong. He is so strong, and he did it a full tear conservative. Yes, league. he had oh, a full amazing. tear in I believe 2014, so a long time ago. And uh, basically, he lives in a very remote village in Siberia, like a long distance from the nearest town. And by the time he got himself properly diagnosed and uh, like he knew he had to make he had to undergo a surgery, it was already too late and it was inoperable. So he basically just flew through with it and had to was forced to do it in a conservative way. And uh, Still, in a couple of years, he managed to recover his one finger, one arm pull up with 16 kilos on the injured arm without having the surgery. So basically, his other other elbow flexors took the part Amazing. that the bicep was doing. But as far as I know, he still had trouble with the straight arm strength and never fully recovered his cross. And uh, yeah. Hefesto, I haven't is... seen doing him doing him doing Hefestos anymore, but when it comes to like pronated pull-ups, one arm pull-ups, uh, front lever pull-ups, all that stuff was just fine. I think that's probably the scariest part, or at least the, the, the biggest worry is straight arm work. You know, all these stories I hear that people can back get back to the street lifting. Um, but I I often hear that. The, the straight arm work, especially like Maltese, uh, full planche, those or, or, or back lever, even back lever, those particular movements um, are the ones to where you can't really bypass the bicep. Whereas you can get insanely strong brachialis and the brachioradialis with pull ups, etc. So I feel like I'm pretty certain in a year I can get my street lifting back. But the question is, can I? One of my goals has always been to able to, to be able to do a fun gelder on the rings. You know, Maltese press to, to full planche. Yeah, with a torn bicep. I don't know if that's going to be, uh, yeah. 
I don't know if that's realistic. And that's something I just have to think about. How long have you been training for, Matthew? Like, how many years have you been? Uh... Uh, 10 years, almost exactly. I started in 2013, seriously. Oh, sick. Okay. So, and where do you, where, so this is just, Philip, sorry for, uh, for asking a yeah, question. I'm just it's curious. Perfect. Um, where do you, where are you going with your career? With your training career? Right now, I've been chasing a 200 kilo dip for a long, long, long time. And basically I overburned myself. And right now I'm really switching focus to pulling. So right now I will focus on my pulling for a while. And once I am recovered psychologically, I will force dips again. But right now it's pulling and uh, it's just like the podcast is exactly at the time when I managed to break through my old barriers in pulling so my old pr was 125 kilo pull up and uh, last week i broke through with a 127.5 chin up congrats man that's amazing congrats. yeah and are you are you planning on competing is that something yes you i'm right now i'm around four weeks out from a world championship in uh, moscow wrpf federation Okay, sick. And uh, have you thought about what you're going to do after the street lifting career? Or do you even see an ending? Or do you have never even thought about that? Well, uh, I don't really plan this far out because uh, the future is probably unpredictable. But as far as I can see my future right now, it will be connected with physical activity and uh, sports achievements. And if street lifting doesn't cut it for me because of my age, I thought about switching to arm wrestling, especially seeing people like John Brzenk and Devon Larratt competing at incredible levels at 50 and even almost 60 years old as John does. So that's interesting. So the reason why I'm asking all this is once I tore my biceps, I, I had to suddenly think about these questions myself. And something my one of my best friends asked a week ago, and it was a very good question that I've never thought about, is why do you want to become much stronger than you are now, is what he asked me. And for years, I would just say, yeah, because I just want to become stronger, you know, I just want to be better, I just want to keep improving. But I've been, I've been training for 12 years now, and I've, I've, it's at a point, like, I'm not progressing very fast anymore. Like, in the beginning, you would, like, literally add, like, 30 kilo on a lift within a few months. Whereas now adding like even five kilo is a hype for me, like in a, in, in half a year, it's like, oh, sick, let's go add a half kilo. Now I can do like 85 kilo pull ups for me um, for, for, versus 80 kilo last year. So that's that's how little progress that I'm making right now. Or I'm adding one second to my front lever. I'm now at 50 second. Yo, I can do 51. Sick. You know, it's it's very exciting for me. But once once he asked me this question. Um, he made me think about other sports. You know, there are other sports. There's stuff like climbing. There's stuff like like bouldering, for example, which is something calisthenics athletes are also good at. Or like arm wrestling, like you mentioned. Um, and just thinking of making that switch, which is something I've never thought about in my life, but making a switch to a different sport where you can, again, make a lot of progress, really speaks to my heart. <laughs> like... It was, it was very weird to think about that. And right now, I'm in a point where I decided calisthenics is always going to be my core. I'm always going to have, like, I'm, I hope to at least have a 40-second front lever minimal at all times. I hope to get at least, like, I hope to get a full planche back. We'll see if that happens. At, at least, like, a bunch of 90 degrees push-ups. Like, one on pull-ups need to always be easy for me. Those things are the minimal but do I want to, because I don't compete. I've never, like I've only competed a few times in my life ever. I'm not, I'm not much of a competition guy. But do I want to, do I want to become even stronger? Do I, what am I chasing? Like for you, you have clear goals. Like you're, you're at competing. You're doing world, world talk competitions. You're, you're, you're breaking literally world records. Whereas I, you know, I've been trying to break the, the front level world record, but now I got another big injury. So I have to wait again. Um, and I'm not competing. I'm not really sure if I should be doing that. So I was curious if, if from your perspective, and maybe even from Phil's perspective, if you look at the situation like this, someone who's been trained for 12 years, who's now like 
he's got a whole different career, like a medical doctor career, and who's obsessively still training, not even competing. Does it make sense what I'm doing? <laughs> Uh, and what are you doing exactly? So before this injury, I was going for the world record fun lever. Um, the world record is at around 59, 60 seconds. I had 46 seconds a few years ago without specifically training for it. So I just, because planche has always been my main mission, fun lever was a side hustle. And I got the fun lever easily, like at 46 seconds without hard, training hard for it. And then eventually I decided let's train for it. I got 51, almost 52 seconds before the injury. And I was adding seconds every three months. That was my goal. As for the other movements, like planche, Maltese, et cetera, I was never going to be the best at it, but I was, I was getting really good at Maltese pressing, et cetera. I was getting good at, like, um, I'm 62 kilos. I can do 85 kilo uh, pull-ups, for example. Something I also never specifically trained. I trained that as, like, a um, side mission for my front lever. Um, so I, I was strong. I wasn't the strongest, but I was strong without specifically working on, speci on particular things. And for the first time in my life in the past few years, I wanted to actually become the strongest at these things. Well, in my opinion, why stop? I mean that, of course, the tear you got is bad and especially the partial tear is bad because of the listed reasons but still there i am completely sure that if you put everything you've got into recovering and into rebuilding yourself you can absolutely rebuild yourself back to your full capacity and continue grinding and setting records the only thing you have to do is to find a way <laughs> and to commit yourself to it and especially and opinion, it's just about yeah. not giving up and not letting the situation break you. Instead, you have to dom dominate the situation, not let it dominate you. This is exactly the decision that I made after my bicep tear. Like, I also had the same thoughts in my head. Like, now I'm not invincible anymore. I don't know if my body will ever be back to its full capacity. And then I made a decision. Like, it's not about what my body will allow me. It's... I will force it to be back 110%. And one and a half yeah. years later, here I am with a new PR in weighted chin up, the exercise that broke me. How old are you? 23 at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Philip, you had something to say? Yes, for me, it depends on what is your goal. So right now you are tested by whatever you believe in, uh, may it be the universe, may it be, yeah, uh, you are now tested if you really want it. If you, if the universe tests uh, Matthew, if we stay with this uh, image, Matthew is definitely the kind of person, he is so determined on this one thing, this is like the essence of his life, and we talked about it in, in other interviews, he will not be stopped by this injury. You now have the decision to make, is it really the thing that you want? Is it really the thing that you 100% burn for? And I don't even see it in this like motivational, like I really admire your motivational like part here, Matthew, and I really feel it. It's like authentic for you. But this is really the decision that you can make now, Yad. Do I want to concentrate more on my work now? Do I want to concentrate more on a different sport? Do I want to get back to exploring other sports now? Do I want to work on weaknesses? Whatever. Um, but um, it, it takes a lot of willpower now to get back. And I know you can get back if you have like the full de determination to do so. But it's also the chance to go into another direction and to um, look for something else, um, which, which can become the essence of your life in the um, but, um, yeah, it's like a really, I see it as a test and now you have to prove if, if you really want this one thing, or if you make like a break, if you uh, try something else, or if you, you, you have to use it for you somehow, this injury is also a chance yeah. to do something with it. Yeah. Well said. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's really well said. I think that that captures where I'm at in this, uh, this part of my life, like for 12 years, I've always been saying what Matthew has been saying. For 12 years, I mean, this crazy dude who's always like, you have to imagine, I, I during medicine, you have, you have to put in a lot of hours, right? So uh, there were times where I had my surgery tracked 
it would start at seven in the morning. I bought a gym for my house, then proceeded to wake up every day at five in the morning. Very cold, warm up for the dips. It took like so long to warm up for dips. I'm like, okay, now 20, now 40, okay, now 50, okay, now 60, 70, 80, 90. Almost ready to go to gym. I can finally do my working set because it's so cold, man, in the morning. And then eventually I do my sets. I do my 90 degrees push-ups. I do my one on pull-ups. I get to work. I did that for two years, this rigorous structure. And I would get home, eat fast, fast, protein shake. Oh, bro, it's nine o'clock. I need to sleep. I need eight hours of sleep so I can wake up at five and do it again. That I did. That was how determined I was. That was the period where I, I put my, like, there was no time for anything else. That was my life. And part of me finds it super hard to let that go, you know, because that's a lot of investment you put in, right? That's a lot of investment. But there's also a huge part that, just like Matthew said, after he's done, he knows he's going to be doing stuff with physical therapy. Uh, or I mean, like physical exercise, I mean, for me, I also build up a lot of knowledge as a doctor and calisthenics. You know, I've always been thinking about like, how can I help people? How can I get people stronger? I've been making YouTube tutorials now. They've been doing really well. And I don't want, I, I know one thing for sure. I'm never going to let go of calisthenics. That's something I just cannot do. I can't, I can't. That's not like even you'll find me at 70 year old. I'm sure still doing a fun lever. There's no way that I can't. There's, you cannot, you're not going to take that away from me. That part, you won't be able to take away from me. But you are right, Philip, that I, am, I can now do other stuff. Because when you're in this mindset where you're fully focused, it also prevents you from doing a lot of stuff. For example, I tried climbing for a bit, but I noticed it had impact on my calisthenics training, so I had to basically stop. You know, I enjoyed it. I was like, yo, this is so fun, sick, yo. But, I, but then I noticed, yo, my front lever isn't growing anymore. I need to stop. Or... You know, I go skiing, but I'm like, yo, maybe I shouldn't go ski. If I fall and I break my wrists, I'm, I'm screwed. I shouldn't probably do that. And so by just changing the priority, I'm not even changing that I'm doing calisthenics. It's a huge mindset shift because, again, it's going from Matthew's mindset. Yo, we're fully going to it to, to going to, yo, we're just going to do it. And we're also going to do other stuff. That part is where I'm at. I think those are the two choices I'm, I'm I'm now sitting on, and I have no idea which one I should do. I'm completely lost. Well, and is this the first time you're actually faced with determining exactly where your priorities are? Because uh, I've had this thing when I had to exactly determine my priorities, even before the injury, when I went to compulsory, compulsory military service and I was stripped of my life completely. Oh, Jesus. Okay, so I didn't get anything big as that. I did have big injuries in the past. Not as, not as big as this, where I, where I had to think about it. But for me, the way um, this went is I, I studied at, at high school and eventually I had to make a decision. What am I going to do? And I said, I want to do something with calisthenics. So I became a doctor. <laughs> so I literally became a doctor for calisthenics. So for me... Uh, um, it's not like how you said where, where, cause you, you made a decision a long time ago and then life tried to take that away from you. And you were like, nah, I'm going to keep going that. What I did is I made a decision a long time ago and I built my entire foundation on it. And luckily it's a foundation that could go any other side, but it is a foundation that I built around calisthenics. But, but that, yeah. So we are completely different in that sense. So that, that's very interesting to hear. So, Tell me some more about that because I'm really interested. What what happened? What what? How did you train during that period? What did you do? So I knew that, you know, injuries happen. You have to be ready. But if it did happen, you still can push through. And I didn't really find it with the injury because I already had that mindset formed. And that's why going through the bicep tear, it was easy for me. The oh, hard I thing... The hard thing for you is that you have these both things happening at the same time, the injury process and the priority re rebuilding process. It's all happening for you at once. And your situation, therefore, is probably more difficult than mine was. No, I, I, think, I think you're right to say that the two things are happening at the same time. I have to think about my priorities. Um, because you're right. There's another thing that happened at the same time. I, I'm, this is my first year as a doctor. 
and I have to decide what I want to specialize in, you know, and I've always said, I want to specialize in sports medicine. You know, I want to be the doctor for people, athletes, because I am an athlete. I know how athletes feel. I, I can help athletes because almost no, none of the doctors I know understand what we go through. Yes. You know, I want to be that guy. Yeah, I, I also, that guy. when I was recovering, I really felt the sharp need for that guy because regular doctors, doctors, they don't know what we feel and how we are. They, exactly. And even now and during this process, I can see that again. I can see that frustration that I, that I, I'm, I'm not getting the questions answered that I need to be answered. I, I don't feel like there people are actually going through the same decisions that I'm going through. And I still see, and it's still going to be one of my major goals in life to be that guy. Um, and I know that I'm located in the Netherlands. I will find a way to be there for everyone. I am going to find ways to do this because I needed this since I was started this journey from 14 years old to now 27. Every single time I came across a problem, not, there was no one who could help me. And I, I want to be able to be the answer to that, to that problem that, the, that we both have had. But eventually, I have to make it. I have to make a decision: Do I become do, do I become a sport doctor, or do I also become the surgeon? Do I also become the person who operates? Like you mentioned, there's this specialist in tendons who now who operates on tendons, etc. Who's super good at that. That would be amazing to be able to do that too within calisthenics, within gymnastics, within powerlifting, within weightlifting. To have a guy that you can trust, that you know he he lives the life. And he can also help me because he, he's helped many other people. Yeah. To... And actually, yeah. <laughs> actually, what I wanted to say is that it's like your situation with the tear is actually it might be, uh, so to say, a God given for you. Because if you want to be a guy who specializes on tendons and recovery and you also yourself went through that successfully, that's a whole another dimension, man. So, yeah. in my opinion, you absolutely must overcome your thing completely. So, it doesn't bug you anymore. It doesn't uh, decrease your potential. So, you can then help <laughs> other people do the same exact thing with your own No, hands. you're right. This, essentially, you're saying this story is bigger than just my own yes. injury. It can help many more people. And yes. I think this is what this podcast is also for. Uh, because... When I got injured, I had to search far and wide for other stories. And I think it really helps to hear these two different stories uh, about an injury that is so, so painful. So not painful physically, because again, I don't know about you, but I didn't have that much pain. It was the pain here, the mental pain, the, the pain that you can't progress, the pain in my case that I'm not sure if I can ever progress. But for me, there's another whole side to it. I am a doctor, and one of my goals has always been to be there for these athletes. For us, all of us, I'm living this life, and this is another injury that I've added to my list that I also want to be able to help people with. So, but that tract, the surgery tract that I'm talking about, is a big one. It's one where I have to give up even more of my life. It's going to be even harder. It's going to be me day and night in, 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 in the hospital, learning, 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 six years long specializing. And even the job opportunities for orthopedic surgeon in the Netherlands is very slim. There's almost no jobs. So if I'm deciding, if I decide to go for even that tract, I have to really want it. I have to fight for it because I know I can do it if I want it, but I have to really, 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 really want it. It's a big, it's a big journey. It's a big decision in my life. It's many decisions I suddenly have to make out of nowhere. <laughs> and um, this podcast really helps. Um, like, Philip, I, I really want to thank you like, for even starting this. It's really, it's really nice to reflect on this with, with someone like Matthew, uh, who has gone to s similar things, but has a completely different perspective than me. It's, it's super helpful. That's uh, that's what I think is so powerful. Like, uh, it may it be in sports, may it be in, in relationships, but also in business. When you have a, a problem, when you have a situation, 
uh, there is this principle of a mastermind of exchanging yourself with someone who already experienced uh, the situation you're currently experiencing. And this is how you can uh, like double down, fast forward the, the learning curve. And Matthew, this is also what you did. I think in the beginning, you also, when you had the, this injury, you had the network of people who you knew that had the same situation and you talked with them, you learned from them. Yes. Uh, and otherwise well, I think you wouldn't have the contact as well with the surgeon uh, that quick. So um, I think that it's a principle for life in general. If you want to uh, solve a problem, you have to find someone who already experienced this problem and uh, get to know his, his approach and his experience. Yes, exactly. And uh, actually, the guy who helped me the most was not the guy who tore the bicep. He was the guy who tore the back. And uh, his story is especially crazy. If you want to hear about it, I will tell. But essentially, uh, he is the bicep curl world record holder, Nizami Tagiv. And uh, before he set his world record, he had a back torn. And he went through the process of recovery incredibly fast and set his all-time strict curl record in less than a year from the tear. And uh, a little bit more than a year after... He tore the second pack. <sighs> and uh, he also had these considerations because, you know, the one time that surgery happens, it's uh, hard, you know, it's, but it's still manageable. But when the second time you really start to question whether you need it or not. And uh, as far as I know, he is back to sports activity and he's preparing again, but... As far as I know, he doesn't really push bench press as hard as before anymore. Your why, why you're doing this needs to be big enough to see around these obstacles. You know, I always have this, uh, this image in my head. You have to have this goal, this why, why are you doing what you're doing? Matthew, you want to be the, the, the like remembered as the best street lifter and you want to set new standards. You want to set world records. You want to uh, prove yourself that you can, you can determine, you can push your body and uh, apart like um, what is, what is humanly possible. And your why needs to be big enough to, uh, yeah, to, to deal with these tests um, and to deal with these uh, challenges that come. And I can imagine when, when tearing a, a pack for, for the first time, you think, oh, damn, <clears throat> uh, I have to go through this now. But when it happens the second time, also uh, you already know what will be happening and what will be yeah. this uh, process of healing. And I think mentally it's even harder to go through it the second time because you, yeah, as you said, you start questioning yourself. The, the doubts are getting louder. One of the difficult things I struggle with since uh, a few years is, um, you know, I, I'm an athlete, but I'm also a medical doctor. And as a medical doctor, you're very realistic. You look at data, you're very logical, you're very unemotional. You just uh, base things on the facts, on the science. And then there's the sci there's an athlete part, you know, I watch anime, I'm hyped, motivation, you know, overcome, be better, stronger. And... You know, Matthew, um, kind of during this conversation, kind of pushed me more towards my athlete side because the doctor in me, the fact says, you know, conservative is, is probably a bad prognosis. You know, it's going to be hard. There's a chance you can't do this, this, that. But then there's also what he rightfully says, the reason why I've come to this level of training, that I've become this strong is not because I know only the science, it's that there's also a hard, very strong will that is able to overcome, that is able to be that exception, you know, because science is always based on the 95% confidence interval. I can be that 5% on the other sides. That happens. And then that's what makes an athlete strong is when you are the exception. And for the past few weeks, I've been more on the doctor side, you know, a little bit negative, to be honest. But hearing these stories pushes me against to my athlete side. I've done things in the past. I've overcome injuries that I shouldn't have been able to overcome. I've done things that are not possible that I've done. So it's good to remind myself of that. You know, it's you don't always have to be Dr. Yad. You can also be athlete Yad. 
Um, and it's, I think this conversation, what it did for me is kind of pushed me back to, to that part. And I think I'm going to, um, this really helps more my thinking because uh, I want to do some curls after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I really think this, this is your positioning yard and this is your strength. Like uh, as Matthew said already, you can use this, you can see this as a God-given uh, thing that happened in your life and that strengthens your positioning in the calisthenics scene as someone who looks at it realistically, but who can also see the mental challenges and the emotional background of an athlete. And uh, this is something that traditional doctors don't have at all, at all, like uh, from personal experience, from friends, etc. Doctors is like always uh, a gamble if you have like uh, a good one or not. And um, this is why I think it's so helpful, as you see in, in Matthew's uh, career, to have someone who um, is, is an expert and who can, um, yeah, who can help you really. Yes. And uh, when I was recovering, uh, I had a physio and uh, the physio actually, he, he was that guy. He was the old school calisthenics legend, Grace Mirnov, who did like, no way. yes, he was the guy who made my recovery protocols and gave me all the tasks that I needed to complete. And he contacted myself. He contact, contacted me and offered his help. And I'm really grateful that my recovery was handled not by like a regular doctor who only worked with uh, normal people, but by a guy who has accomplished all of it himself. And uh, he also worked with Nikonisimov yeah. and his partial tears, so he really had experience with that. But I still, I pushed myself even harder that, than he allowed me to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean... Athletes always do that, man. Athletes are really uh, want to do that. Always do that. He probably changed the protocol yes. so that you don't <laughs> yeah. push. You know, he probably accounted for that. <laughs> and the fun part was uh, like two months after the surgery, around sixty days. I did my six by six with twenty five kilos on pull ups and posted this on Instagram. And my surgeon, who made the injury, who made the surgery, he saw that and he contacted me basically. It was more polite than than that, but the message basically was, uh, uh, "What are you doing, idiot? Stop immediately and go back to your normal protocol." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's funny, man. So he follows you on Instagram? <laughs> no, he doesn't. But I tagged him. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> oh man, it was fun, that's, but that's a fun story. <laughs> yeah, nothing could stop me at that point. No, I admire you for that, man. Honestly, it's, it's really cool to see that. That's true. One thing I have to ask you, Matthew, um, <clears throat> you'd, uh, you've torn your biceps during the wide chin-ups. And at that time, when we were talking about it in the, in the office and like thinking about it, how it happened, etc., we thought, oh, uh, like the, I think the, the pressure on the biceps doing wide chin-ups is like more higher than usual. But now you went back to doing it again and you're like, how can you have the confidence in your body and the, the, to, to do it again in this form that injured you? Well, I'm not doing the form that injured me. That's the thing. Because uh, the width of the chin-up grip, it wasn't the issue. The issue was me not fully, fully locking out the bottom. So basically what I did, I did a lot of speed wrapping and uh, it was like this. So I don't fully lock out and uh, the strain, the load, it doesn't go into the hard structures it stays here on the tendon so this it pulls on the tendon oh, so a lot a reflex yes yes like and the, part. okay the load doesn't really get off the tendon so a couple of months of that and uh, it gave out so what i'm doing now you probably saw that is i do all my chin ups dead stop I was going to say, I was going to say, I think you probably do that then. That makes more sense. Yeah. Yes. And this is exactly the reason why I'm so confident because uh, when the tear happens, basically it's always this motion. So eccentric with a lot of like when you are really controlling it. And uh, when my tear happened, I entered the chin up with a little bit of a bent arm and then straighten it out before pulling up and this 
eccentric, it was the reason for the injury. And right now, I just enter with completely locked arms, and this this just doesn't happen. And mm-hmm. that's why I'm completely confident and uh, sure that I'm safe, and there is no fear. Only like I know what I'm doing. Yeah. So one of one of the things I've been thinking about the future for my training career is uh, often I would do tr- stretch reflex in a lot of movements, you know, uh, on dips, on pull-ups, you know, you hang, boom, you bounce immediately up, and which is okay, which is fine. You, you can do that if for periods, but it is a slightly higher risk, uh, enough higher risk to get injured. And one thing that I'm doing during my rehab now is very controlled eccentrics till the end range of motion. So the entire range of motion of the eccentric is very controlled. Uh, this is especially important during your rehab but I think I might take that with me to even when I'm completely recovered to, to also do it like that, um, to, cause you, I'll, I'll probably do a little bit more, less load, but I'll probably be playing it safely. And then for competition, if I would ever do competition, I could maybe for a very short burst do like, you know, at that time I could, you know, change the form a little bit, not too much. You always want to be specific. Um, but what he's saying is exactly what I would do based on what I was thinking in the past few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll cut that. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep it in, man. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay nice yeah no but um honestly um street lifting is also another thing i've been considering uh so i'd still stay within calisthenics and i'd be doing street lifting which is also a lot of fun um did, did you ever do statics uh, matthew or did you always start tra- street lifting well i did some statics like Yes, I did. So basically, the yes, I have to admit, I did, I did statics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I never really got the planche down, but front lever, like one arm pull ups. I even had Hefesto, Iron Cross, different muscle ups, all kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh. But, but, but you quickly s- switched to street lifting, I think. Yes, pretty quickly. Because. Yeah. Uh, I wanted my strength to be like, I, I wanted to be able to know exactly where I'm at. And street lifting gives you that opportunity with exact numbers. And um, would you ever go back in statics now or are you like, nah? Well, uh, the thing is that I know I would never be the best at statics because I'm just too heavy too big yeah, for that yeah. and for street lifting this physique is perfect so i better stick to what i'm built for that makes sense yeah yeah because i've been really considering street lifting also uh, it's probably safer for me than than, st- than statics with, with my current injuries um and it's something i think i can also get good at because my my foundation is not bad my foundation is pretty good for my height um but 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 I know for the the world championship this year for street lifting was insane at my weight class the sixty six kilo. There was Ashura uh, who did like a 100, 100 kg pull up, um, a forty kg muscle up I think, uh, and uh, like crazy numbers. I I don't even know the dips and but it was like super high numbers. Well, um, the dip and... wasn't the dip was around one seventeen point five as far as I can remember. So he is an oh. incredible puller. He is unri- well, probably Andre Alexandrov, the only guy who can probably rival his pulling. But when it comes to the dip, it's uh, beatable, absolutely. Yeah, but his squad was also good, huh? Yeah. yeah. So I think he also had a when it comes to the full package, though, he is incredibly strong. Yeah. Yeah, he's impressive. So I, I looked at that a few weeks ago when I was thinking, maybe street lifting. Then I saw him. I was like, holy, <laughs> he's strong. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's impressive. No, but I've, 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 I'll see what happens. I'll recover. I'll see how far I can get back with the pull-ups. If I can get back to 85 again, 
Uh, and if I can get 85, do I feel like I could even go to 100? If I do, then I might make, make the shift. Well, if I don't, then I'm just going to enjoy life. Are you going to train pull-ups, not chin-ups? Um, I usually... Uh, I'm, I'm curious to what you think, because I've been using it as a supplement. I usually do neutral, because neutral always felt the nicest. I didn't think hard much about this, only because it's the only thing that felt the nicest for my shoulder, for my elbow, and for my wrist. Yeah, it may be good as a foundation for your future work, but if you want to be competition-specific, it won't cut it. No, you're right. Yeah. You need to be specific to the to the lift. So would you recommend pull-up or, or chin-up? Well... Uh... Pull up would be a safer option, but it's it has a little bit less potential load. So chin ups are always like for absolutely most people are a little bit stronger, and uh, in your case they have the another advantage of the possibility of tearing your bicep completely and having your surgery done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then I get the then yeah. I finally get the operation. I can get back to work, bro. <laughs> Yo, let's go to hundred. I'm gonna just give me a sec. I'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> we can do another podcast. <laughs> yeah. But why is that, Matthew? That uh, like many of the pullers, maybe it's my like a lot of friends ask me, hey, why do the uh, top athletes at at final rep at the last world championship? Why do the top pullers all do pull ups and not chin ups? Is it like random because uh, they are just uh, like this? But I know Ludovic, uh, Pere, like Frederick, like all, all of them do pull more than pull, uh, like chin. Well, it's because their training history, probably, as far as I can tell, like the introduction of the chin up to street lifting happened not that long ago. And by the time it happened, all the top athletes were already at high level with their pull ups. So switching to chin ups was a thing that was high risk, low reward because their pull-ups is already like they are already so strong at the pull-up that it doesn't really make sense for them to switch to a completely different movement for potentially gaining like extra what five kilos. So it's better to stick with the pull-up. And also another opinion on that comes from Pere. And he said that, yes, the chin-up may be a little bit potentially stronger, but the pull-up has more carry over to the muscle up and in all four it's basically it's the thing that can potentially make the pull up as beneficial as the chin up the extra very good point Holy extra shit, kg yeah. to the muscle up so uh, i don't think it's random it's just these two reasons first of all the they already had strong pull-ups and second the reason is the carry over to the muscle up interesting but if nice. we are talking about the classic street lifting duo the pull up the pull up and the chin up there uh there is much stronger reasoning for using chin ups because you don't have the muscle up in there no you're right so What's the situation now with the different competitions? Because I saw the the competition, the world champ from uh, what, what was it called? Run rep, final, final rep, rep. Or final rep. That you have a squat, you have a dip, you have a muscle up, and you have a pull up or chin up, right? That's what's going on now. What what about other other competitions that you're referring to that don't do that? The the classic. Yes. So this all four format is very young. I, as far as I can tell, it started only in 2019 in Vienna, where Adam was there and you were there also, and I couldn't go. It probably, as far as I know, it was the first all four competition, and it went from there, and it picked up really a lot of popularity and. Uh, the classic the classic format is what was before that so only pull up and dip and the pioneers of the classic format were Denis Minin and his organization in Ukraine and uh, later on it got picked up by the ISF and the Russian organizations and uh, in Europe the classic it doesn't really happen anymore it's at, at least uh, as far as i can tell sometimes they happen in Italy and there also was something in the Netherlands by the ISF, the ISF World Championships 
but as far as I know, the ISF like the events that ISF hosts in Europe are a disaster. A lot of bad things are happening there. Okay. And uh, in Russia, the classic format is still going strong. We have the ISF and we also have the WRPF, which is a powerlifting federation that also decided to include street lifting into their into their events and. Uh, the competition that I will be participating in is uh, held by the WRPF. I, I have a question. Um, something I heard um, one of my friends say who's into the street lifting world. He said the problem with having the squat, for example, in the in the four uh, the four lifts is that any professional powerlifter who is very good in powerlifting, if they would jump in, they would probably dominate the competition. What, what do you guys think about that? Because I, I thought it was a good point. Well, uh, there is specifically a thing done to prevent that is and that is the inclusion of the muscle up because not a lot of professional powerlifters with super heavy squats can muscle up cl with clean form especially. And uh, if you don't complete even a bodyweight muscle up, your total is annulated and you basically go zero. Okay, but still, like, still, uh, like someone like Yuri Belkin, who is uh, participating maybe in a hundred kilo weight class, and uh, he has like a four hundred plus kilo squat, and he can easily train himself to do a clean muscle up and respectable numbers right. on dips and pull ups. Yes, if someone like this enters, it's game over. But the thing that the competition organizers say is that if a guy like this comes and wins, it's deserved. True. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it, it does it does put calisthenics or street lifting in a worse spot where a completely different athlete jumps in your sport and dominates you and then goes away again. Well, um, actually... The, I don't know what the solution is. The same <laughs> thing can probably happen if an elite weightlifter joins the powerlifting and just quickly brings up his deadlift and bench and... Basically. That's actually true. That's actually a good point. Yeah, that that's true. No, I was I was curious because I, I thought it was a good point. I I as a as a static guy don't train legs, as you might know. <laughs> so if I do street lifting, I have to. Uh, I can finally allow myself to do that. Um, I I did I did like seven years seven eight years ago when I was young still in my training career. I did do that legs and deadlifts, etc. It was really fun. But then eventually when I started uh, focusing on, you know, trying to get elite levels, I had to stop, get these thin boys. But now if I've decided to make the switch to street lifting, that's why I was asking this. I was like, um, wondering what your position was in this and whether it's going to change maybe in the next few years. Well, as far as I can tell, it's not going to change because all four is getting more popular by the year. And even like, Classic guys like Pere was a classic guy before, and he started squatting to com to compete in all four. How is your approach now, Matthew? Because uh, we yeah we know that uh, you're like in your especially in, in pull and and dip you're like out of this world. And uh, in the if you want to participate in a classic four, you need to also do the other two. No. Well, uh, I would prefer to keep it as a secret. Okay, so I will, hey, I will enter all four. I will, but uh, I will not spoil my squad for now. Okay. It has to be a surprise when I come in. Is it more than three digits or is it uh, less than or... three digits? <laughs> You're joking, man. Like, I will not tell what it is. Like, I started just recently, probably like three month in, months in or so, but. When I enter the competition, better believe me, I'll be ready. Nice. Wait, so you didn't train squats for all these years? Well, uh, I had my squat foundation built in 2016 and 17. And after that, I never really squatted. But somehow my strength never, like, it never went away. And uh, reaching my peak squatting took like two months at max. Yeah, but that's because every time you stand up and you dip, you're already squatting like yeah. 150 plus. And also, <laughs> I I really have a lot of daily activity. I walk a lot, so my legs are always active. 
Yeah, you have an extremely strong core. Like uh, I think also like from the back, uh, oh, not yeah. even like being a specialist in squats, but seeing Matthew, uh, I think this this foundation that you have, you always uh, post your uh, uh, twenty thousand steps that you do per day. Uh, the the extreme back and core muscles that you have through uh, dipping and squatting, uh, and also you have like a quite strong pistol squat. No, I think I remember. You well, had, like... I did fifty kg without even training for it. Yeah. yeah, but it came from the squat foundation that I built er in earlier years. Yeah, so yeah, I, I'm really curious. For me, <laughs> for me, when I started dipping like a bit heavier for me, I was like doing a 95 for 3 3. Um, the standing up was heavy, bro. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> It was bad, bro. Yeah, yeah, it's bad if this becomes the limiting factor, like uh, not being able yeah, to. You're like, yo, I can't go <laughs> higher. It's easy for this, but my legs, bro. It's like it's being on 20 reps for 95, but you can't go up because your legs are just shivering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and especially with weights like 150, 160 and above, it's really not that easy to stand up. But I don't really feel it. And also, especially with the dips, with pull-ups, not so much, but even with pull-ups and chin-ups, you really work your adductors when you pull and dip heavy because you hold on to the plates a lot. You have to squeeze them. And uh, I've had my volume chin-ups on Monday and uh, my adductors were sore for two days. Holy shit, this guy. Yeah, Matthew is doing new types of exercises. just built different. Yeah. Great. Guys, I think we talked about a lot of things today. Um, I think uh, it was really nice for the people and uh, big, big thank you to being both so open about your, uh, your yeah, challenges, yard, mental challenges, Matthew, mental challenges, physical challenges. I think it's really important to show these sides and to transfer the knowledge uh, from one generation to the others. Um, and yeah, I'm really deeply thankful to both of you taking the time and investing this into like free knowledge for for the community and uh, yeah i just wish you both uh, the best in recovery yard and in progress matthew uh, it will be a great uh, future and uh, yeah if you use it for you the injury i think uh, many great things can happen thank you so much thank you for organizing this again i've already mentioned during the podcast that this is very valuable for me in a perfect timing four weeks we're now about to really do rehab. So this is uh, this is great motivation. And thank you, Matthew, for being here also, for uh, motivating me, bro, for being strong. 